and I had been meditating on a chapter in Isaiah, and uh, I went to the pantry, I opened up the doors because I was going to have a snack, and the verse came to mind, why do you seek fullness in something that does not satisfy? Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Asherita, welcome for the first time to Focus on the Family. Thank you so much for having me here. It's my pleasure. Um, This is a really interesting topic. It's a fairly narrow topic. We don't have a lot of guests that talk Mm. specifically the way you have addressed the issue in your book, and that's what caught our interest and the desire for us to share it with hopefully millions of people listening right now. Yeah, that's my prayer. I mean, what, it, What's your food story? Tell me about it. Well, I didn't want to write about food. <laughs> <laughs> who does? Right? I mean, who Other than a recipe book. Say, yeah, like I struggle with food. But, but that's the story of millions of women and men. And I think we, we get held back by shame. And we don't want anyone to know our struggle. Uh, for me, the the turning point was my first daughter's first birthday. We had a very hungry caterpillar party, and um, everything. <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, this it was it. lovely. She yeah. won't remember any of it, of course. But we went all out, and um, I remember tearing down party decorations and bringing stuff inside. And I'd brought the cake in and grabbed just one one bite of cake, and one bite turned into five. And then I went back and brought more stuff back in. And every time I'd stop by the cake because I needed just a little bit more. What flavor was this cake? It was um, Tell marble. me chocolate. Marble. Okay, good. <laughs> it had to be a good one. It was. <laughs> but it was mostly the sugar rush and the yeah. sugar high. And before I knew it, I had demolished half of this caterpillar shaped cake. Now, was that the first time that, you know, that got your attention that, man, I'm... I'm going to town on this cake. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd overeaten before and, you know, I left the table with that stuffed feeling of, ugh, I shouldn't have eaten that much. But, but that was almost an out of body experience where, where I was looking at myself and saying, why am I still eating? I'm not hungry anymore. Mm. I don't want this anymore. It doesn't even taste good anymore, but I almost can't stop myself. Well, that, that really is the question. Um, Why? Yeah. What, what drives a person to move in that direction. I mean, I could see that, you know, those little pints of haagen Oh, yeah. On occasion, I mean, you can take a couple of bites, and then before long, ooh, the pint's gone. <laughs> what yeah. happened to that pint? Now, that's a small portion, isn't it? <laughs> Depends on who you are. Nobody is in agreement. <laughs> Nobody is agreeing with me here. But uh, but that is the issue. And I yeah. guess the question is, where's that satisfaction coming from? Why do we do that? Uh, kind of that binge eating idea. What's happening to us? Yeah, I mean, I would say there's definitely a physical component to it. And and scientists have recently discovered that, you know, food, sugar, carbs, fats can be just as addicting as drugs. Why is it always the good stuff? I know. I mean, not like I'll lettuce I'll get to that, though. Food tomato. is a good gift. Like, this is, this is one of my, like... I'm not addicted to lettuce and tomatoes. <laughs> it's I mean, hard it, to be. It's bread. It's we, ice cream. Nobody's listening thinking, yeah, he just mentioned lettuce and tomatoes. I have well, to have I some. need to go out. out and get some. <laughs> That's it. But it is good. Um, you know, one of the words used in Scripture is gluttony. It's mm-hmm. not a word that we use commonly today. Right. But it is this. It's what we're talking about, gluttony. Uh, you know, is the overindulgence of food. Mm -hmm. And you eat too much and you see it. Um, You describe it more as a food fixation, Mm -hmm. though. And I I would say when I was talking to Jean, my wife, about this, she really liked that Mm -hmm. concept because it broadens the issue. It doesn't talk about shaming somebody. But describe food fixation. Yeah, so there is a physical component, but there's definitely a mental and a spiritual component as well. And food fixation is this inordinate preoccupation with thoughts and longings for food. So even if you're not necessarily eating a lot, if, if you wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I, what's for breakfast? I can't wait to dig into whatever that that's going to be. And you're constantly thinking about what you're going to eat or what you just ate, how much you ate. If you go to sleep regretting your food choices of the day, if you look in the mirror and you're constantly thinking about food, it means it has mastery over you. And scripture tells us that a person is a slave to whatever has mastered them. Hmm. You know, if you're trying to take a self-assessment, that may still Mm -hmm. be a little difficult for some people. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, some people, you may just eat what's on your plate. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to my doctor 
who said, you know, in the 50s and 60s, the government actually promoted that, that you should have your child eat everything on their mm-hmm. plate. I had no clue. I was a little boy in the mm-hmm. 60s. But isn't that interesting? And he said that's one of the lingering effects of those campaigns Absolutely. where people are feel guilty that they don't eat all their food. You all remember the statement, you know, there's starving children mm-hmm. in Asia and you need to eat all your macaroni and cheese. I don't know how those two thoughts are ever linked, but they're starving people I don't know how somewhere. That helps, but... So you become obese <laughs> on there, their on their behalf. Right. That's one of the lies, and maybe we'll get to that. But there, there are these scripts that are playing in our mind, and that cause us to act a certain way toward food. And and I like to think of food fixation as a spectrum. On the one end, there is this obsessive, maybe emotional eating. On the other end, it might be a very healthy person on the outside, but is obsessing over healthy eating. And that is called orthorexia. I didn't even realize that's an eating disorder as well. Mm -hmm. And it's the same manifestation of food fixation. So back to the self-assessment idea, how how does a person know? It's not necessarily weight that's going to tell you that. Because, you know, I I think people that might be a little higher in their weight aren't necessarily fixating on food. Mm -hmm. They might just eat their plate Mm -hmm. and they're not counting calories. Mm -hmm. So is there a distinction between the two? Yeah, I I think it comes, I'm glad you brought up the idea of an assessment because it is pausing to reflect on your life, on your thoughts, on your heart, asking where do you go after a hard day at work? Oh, that's interesting. Do Mm. you hit your knees and bring those problems to the Lord or do you go to the fridge? Huh. Where do you go when you have an argument with your spouse or when your kids are misbehaving or... Stress eating. Yeah, or sad, happy, stressed, (laughs) all those emotions. What about when you feel hopeless about the future? Mm -hmm. Where do you go at that point? Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you bringing up the the orthorexia thing. We did not know anything about that until several years ago Mm -hmm. when one of my daughters was, she was was obsessed Mm -hmm. with a certain healthy eating Mm -hmm. and a certain way to exercise. And she dropped weight and we Mm -hmm. were concerned. And uh, God intervened and really saved her life, Praise and, and, and I, she's in a good spot now, but that was a really scary moment. It was like, do you have anorexia? No, I'm eating all this good stuff, mm-hmm. and I'm not binging, and mm-hmm. I'm not... Yeah, but you're running like 10 miles a day and eating lettuce and tomatoes and carrots and mustard, mm-hmm. so that was a fixation for hers, yeah. and she had to find out, I don't have to let that drive my life, mm. and so I think she's getting to a place that you're kind of talking about, which is finding satisfaction in God, not in all I can do about this food stuff. But still, that's that's an important thing to recognize. Yeah, it can also be a control thing, right? Mm. Because there's so much in our lives that we don't control. But I can control what I put in my body, right? I can control the purity of the foods that I eat. And so that's often the driving force. And it can be fear. So there's idolatry on one end of food, that food is going to solve my problem. And then there's idolatry of the will, that I can control things, huh, I can be disciplined. But in either case, we're not worshiping Jesus. We're mm. not consumed by a hunger for him. We're not finding our soul's delight and satisfaction in his presence. And that, I want to explore that a little more. Let's move the other side of the equation, kind of the lies that the enemy of our soul mm. tells us, because you specifically go at that yeah. in your book. And I, I think that's important to hear, too, yeah. because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, right? Absolutely. Um, what are some of those lies? Yeah. Um, so one lie is I need to finish everything on my plate. <laughs> that is one. I think I'm guilty. You know, of that. you brought that up. I don't. Jim, but you know, it's that interesting really because I don't. I don't feel it. obsessed with food, but mm-hmm. I I do tend to, you know, eat what's on my plate, and yeah. that was my doctor's point. He goes, you don't really have to do that. And I, gosh, I'm thinking all the way back, I can remember that being the mantra, mm. you know, eat what's given food. to you. We don't waste food. Yeah. And that came out of the, you know, the, the, I'm sure our parents and grandparents who came out of the depression, mm-hmm. that was what they did. Mm-hmm. You know, right. don't waste anything. Make sure you eat it. Now, the problem is when there's plenty, you end up eating too much. Mm-hmm. So that is a lie. Yeah. And it's funny that children don't really struggle with this. My two and a half year old, Amelia, will push away from the table when she's done, when she's had enough. There's this intuitive feeling of fullness, and she's done with the plate. But now we can make the mistake as parents. I did it last night with one of my boys, who is certainly, you know, he's a teenager, but he was not into mom's stew. And I was like, (laughs) finish your stew. And he just said, Dad, I'm, I'm not hungry. Mm-hmm. But we, it kind of turned into a little thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I'm over-exaggerating. But I was, he, I think he could tell I was disappointed mm-hmm. that he wasn't finishing his food. That's not a good thing for parents to do, right? That's yeah, what I'm hearing I, you say. 
I mean, I don't know that put specific situation. Yeah. yeah, but like in in our family, I come from a long line of emotional eaters, and from hmm. women who finish what's on their plate, and women who enjoy cooking and baking and tasting everything as we go. And um, that that birthday party of my daughter's was the turning point where it wasn't just me; it was I don't want to pass this on to my children, hmm. huh. and so something has to stop. What are some of those other lies? We've hit this one. Clean your plate. Yeah. So what I like to do with the lies is is you identify the lie, but then scripture tells us this is a spiritual battle. And so we take up the sword of the spirit and the belt of truth. And so I like to turn to scripture and say, okay, what's the truth about this? If the lie is I have to clean my plate, the truth is I can steward resources wisely and it doesn't have to be me eating everything. How it, does that turn into a practical application? How, just being satisfied, yeah, basically, right? Yeah. Don't so overeat. With a clean plate, it could be I put less on my plate and eat what I have if it's that much. And then the rest of it, maybe if I save $50 on my grocery bill because I'm cooking less and I'm eating less, then that $50 can go to feed the hungry children in Africa. Right. Whereas what's left on my plate doesn't make a difference. Yeah, amazing. Another lie is I deserve this. Right. I've had a, a rough day. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's it's where the hugging does comes in, right? The I kids have been this. acting up. That's right. I have kept my cool all day long. It's but... my time to get a treat. Yes. And... Is that true? <laughs> John, is that true? <laughs> I would never tell my wife it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> or tell myself. I mean, is it true? I mean, well, where so, does that get out of balance? Yeah, I, I, I would think say, sometimes that's okay. Yeah, food is not the enemy. Uh, right. Food is a good gift from a good father given to turn our hearts to him in worship. Our father gives good gifts to his children. And mm. sometimes that ice cream is a gift. It's sometimes, a gift from God, yes. But, but typically it's when we share it with someone else. Mm. In scripture, we seek fellowship over food and food can bring people together. But when I'm locking myself in the pantry because I want my treat, yeah. um, it's possible that I'm medicating something, that I'm trying uh. to cover something up. And the question is, after I, will this treat really help me feel better or will it leave me feeling guilty? Yeah. Is there any room here for it just tastes good? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I just like the way it tastes. Yeah, yeah, and there is that. But then do I need to have two candy bars or can I have just one bite? Yeah. Um, you know, there's scientific research that our taste buds go um, numb after a few bites. So there's the three-bite rule. I can have three bites of this delicious food and enjoy every bite of it and have it be an act of worship. So I end and say, Jesus, thank you for this. Mm. This is Focused on the Family. We're talking to Asherita Chuchu, and uh, her book is called Full, Food, Jesus, and the Battle for Satisfaction. Uh, we've got this and other resources, including a CD or free download of our conversation at focusonthefamily.com slash broadcast. I can hear some woman, though, saying, come on, now, um, that's a little bit controlling. I mean, that's a little bit legalistic. Three bites, really? That's I think all I men can, can participate in that, <laughs> not just women. <laughs> I, I will not put this on anyone. Um, this is between you and the Lord. Hmm. And so I encourage women, take your um, life story with food and bring it to Jesus mm -hmm. and, and ask the Holy Spirit to shine his light and his truth in your life mm -hmm. and to show you, is there an era of your life where you have become a slave to food because you're right the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy but that's not where the verse ends jesus says i have come that you might have life mm -hmm. and have it to the full yeah. so if you're living that full life and food is a part of that then sister brother i i bless you in the yeah. name of the lord this is a good gift from the father yeah. but the enemy doesn't care what it is he will use anything to keep us from finding our satisfaction in yeah, Jesus. That's good. I appreciate that. So with the cake, I mean, I'm going back now because we've moved along, <laughs> but I can't get off of that we're, cake. We're past the lettuce and <laughs> tomato. <laughs> <laughs> that that cake, uh, you consumed it. And mm. what was it, what were your next thoughts after that? The feeling of guilt, I'm mm. sure. Like, oh my goodness, I just yeah. ate half of my kid's birthday cake. Well, it was after the party. Yeah. Well, right, <laughs> so, right. So you didn't take cake out yeah, of the mouth no. of children babes. because of no. the cake. <laughs> we just want to make sure. Yeah. So after that, there, there was guilt. There was despair and disgust. Like, how can I, hmm. how can I, who am I that I'm eating this way? Um, and after that, there was this resolution of, I am going to fix this. And I, I promptly researched, okay, what's a good diet to go on? And I went on the super strict, healthy, I'm not going to name it, but um, it worked. 
it was really good. It helped um, wean me off of sugar and carbs and all the good stuff. And I was eating very healthy. Um, but about three weeks into that, both my husband and my mom um, kind of sounded the alarm and said, you're, you're getting a bit excessive here, a bit obsessed with healthy eating. Mm. And um, they could recognize the beginning warning signs of huh, orthorexia. That quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I tend to be all or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must be because that, you know, you're, you, I would have assumed, oh, look, she's moving in a great direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. Know, that's a good thing. And then there'd be that encouragement that would reinforce that obsession. Mm-hmm. And that you're saying that that's a danger. It, it is dangerous. It pushes you from one side of the pendulum all the way to the other side of the pendulum. Right. So that moderation issue, um, you know, how do we find that moderation? It's interesting to me scripturally when you look at these things like food, but physical intimacy. Um, these are all things that God wants to have control over in your life. Mm-hmm. And these are the core things that we battle. Yeah, I was, these are all gifts, right? God created us as physical beings, and he gave us these wonderful gifts like food, like physical intimacy. Um, and yet every good gift the enemy will try to distort uh. and to use it in a way that... Um, hijacks the pleasures that God has given us to draw us away from finding satisfaction in Jesus. But it's not a hopeless battle because Jesus has won and he Mm -hmm. has equipped us with everything we need to win as well. So in my story, I went from that overly fixated healthy eating to finally hitting my knees and saying, Lord Jesus, you need to take control of this. In fact, Mm. you mentioned, you know, when you have that desire to then invite Jesus into the conversation. Play that out for us. If you have that that food desire all of a sudden, you want to go to the pantry and lock mm-hmm. yourself in, mm-hmm. as you d- described, how do you turn mm-hmm. to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, help me, throw me a life-saving uh, moment here? Yeah. Well, it starts with asking God to even help make us aware of those thoughts and of those triggers, those moments that drive us to food. And um, just the other day, I was driving, I had dropped my daughter off at preschool, and it had been a very stressful morning, and I drove away thinking, I just need a mocha. (laughs) And that, like, will fix it for me. I just, I need that. And and that phrase, I need a, what is it? Hmm. And that for me was was that wake-up moment of, no, I don't need a mocha. I need Jesus. Mm. And Jesus is enough. And some people are going to hear that and go, really? I mean, that seems hyper-spiritual. Uh, but you're saying, no, this is healthy living. This is godly living, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I will have mochas. I had a mocha this morning. But is it from a place of um, I need desperation? Yeah. Or is it from a place of fullness? If I am already full in Jesus, I can enjoy the good gifts he's given me the way he intended for them to be. But if I am craving um, emotional stability or... Um, happiness or peace in my home and I run to the pantry, that will leave me feeling empty every single time. And this is kind of, this is it. This is the critical nature of it. What is it rooted in? Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying over and over again, that, you know, you got to discover what those cravings are rooted in and, you know, giving yourself a little bit of a treat here and there, that's okay. But if it's rooted in desperation, I need Mm -hmm. in order to feel better, Mm -hmm. then you've got a problem. And that's true of all of the human appetites, not just not just food, but Absolutely. like we said, all of our appetites have that issue. On that practical level, um, again, let me come back to how did you begin to hunger after God instead of hungering mm-hmm. after uh, maybe Doritos? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, sugar was it for me. And I, I found myself one morning in my sunroom journaling, and, and the Lord had awakened in me a hunger for him. And I remembered reading um, one of the Psalms, David says... Lord, I want you more than life itself. Mm. And I was saying, Lord, I want you more than life itself. And then I felt the Spirit saying, even more than sugar. Wow, really? And I was like, um, I think so. And um, he prompted me to go on a sugar fast. And that was, this was five years ago. It was the first time I'd even heard of anything like that. Um, I had been reading a book on fasting by John Piper and was very convicted that sugar had... Um, become a stronghold in my life. And it was something that was controlling me. And it it was difficult to reach that point of surrender to say, okay, I, this is a good gift, 
but I will give it up because I want something better. It's a good thing that the Lord has done here to create our bodies in such a way, but it's an abuse of our body, isn't it? Yeah, and what happens on a, on a physiological level, I am not a doctor, but I do love research. And so I looked it up and food addiction ends up changing our brain chemistry where it suppresses the production of serotonin, which is the chemical that helps us feel full and satisfied. And it stimulates bed endorphins, which gives us that happy feeling that this is great. Yeah. And so the more sugar we have, the more we want to have. And it gets to the point, just like a drug addict, where just a little bit isn't enough. I don't need, want just one piece of cheesecake. I want two. I want half. Mm. Um, and when you get to that point of being out of control, it comes back to, does food control you? Or do you control the mm. way you eat? Yeah, no, this has been really good. What are some other ways um, that we can gain victory over food? I mean, obviously, you've talked about the discipline of doing it, turning toward the Lord, help me, Lord, in this moment, maybe taking a time to pray when you feel that urge to, uh, you know, eat, overeat food or go for the sweet food. What are some other ways that we can engage to gain victory over this? Yeah, one of my favorite ways is to memorize scripture. Um, It is the sword of the spirit. It is the way we fight the spiritual battle. And um, there have been times in my life where just memorizing and filling my mind with scripture is what allows the spirit to bring it to mind in that moment of crisis. And I had been meditating on a chapter in Isaiah and uh, I went to the pantry. I opened up the doors because I was going to have a snack. And the verse came to mind, why do you seek fullness? in something that does not satisfy. Mm. And and that was just a pivotal moment where I was like, when we hide God's word in our hearts, it is what God will use to give us victory in those moments. Mm. It helps us identify lies and confront them with truth. And Paul says that we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. That is where the spiritual battle is fought. That is so good. What role does community play? in overcoming that food fixation. I would think, I mean, sometimes as buddies, you know, if we go play golf or something like that, it's pretty normal to go get a bite to eat and maybe we end up eating an appetizer (laughs) and a bite to eat. It's that kind of thing. But Mm -hmm. how can we use community to keep us Mm -hmm. from overindulging? Yeah, Uh, that's a great question because so much of this is a solo struggle. We struggle by ourselves in the dark. In silence, usually. Right. But when we bring it to community, we can link arms with our brothers and sisters and find victory that way. So it can be um, bringing it to the table after your golf outing (laughs) with the buddies and saying, hey, you know what? I've realized I tend to eat a bit too much. Um, So would you guys help me, you know, keep me accountable and eat and just enough and say, enjoy sure, it. sure, we'll, we'll finish off your prize. <laughs> no, that's good. And we're putting that in a guy's context. And yeah. the book's written for women. But, I mean, I would think, you know, I would imagine after a woman's Bible study, you're on the way home, you stop at your favorite coffee place, you get a little bakery item and that latte that you're craving. I mean, those are the kinds of things, right? Right. And, again, those are not bad foods. It depends what drives us to those right. foods. Mm-hmm. Um, but another way to pull in community in this, and this is something I've done even recently, is texting a friend and saying, hey, would we encourage one another in this? And at the end of the day saying, you know what, I have been obedient to the Lord today in the way that I've eaten, and celebrate that with me. Or I have been disobedient. Would you pray with me and help me to stay accountable? What what role, Asherita, does it does a friend play in maybe calling you out? You mentioned how your family members said, hey, you're going too far mm-hmm. on this. What's the role for a friend in that? Tread that carefully. That can be really tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, I, I think it has to start with a person who's struggling, and they have to reach out and give permission to that person, unless it's a parent-child situation or a situation where, you know, you need to guide that person to a, a safe, healthy place if they're dangerously obsessive. But if it's where most of us are, it's a spiritual matter as well as a physical one. So in my marriage with my husband, I I asked him, I came to him and I said, I'm really struggling here. Mm. And you're doing life with me. Like you see when I'm eating too much, you see when I grab the chips after a stressful day, (laughs) would you speak truth to me in those moments? Mm. That's good. Uh, Let's go to the last question, which is really for that person listening going, She's describing me. Mm. This is me. What are those words of encouragement for next steps? Don't eat the cake. I mean, obviously, but what are some of the things they can do as they 
change today? Mm-hmm. Well, it's not as easy as don't eat the cake because I think every person wakes up saying, today is the day I'm going to eat right. Yeah. Um, I would really, if you're the one who's struggling with this right now, I would say turn to Jesus and not in an overly spiritual way, but he is right there yeah. willing and wanting to help you. And then find someone who can hold you accountable And I would take that last step and just challenge you to go on a sugar fast. Find our community on Facebook. Find someone to join with you in this and break the stronghold of food in your life through the power of scripture and prayer and worship. Hmm. Yeah, Sharita, that is a great place to land. I hope this has been helpful to you. Wonderful advice Hmm. in Asherita's book, Full Food, Jesus, and the Battle for Satisfaction. This really hits, I think, the hidden places in the Christian's life. Mm -hmm. And it's so true. Uh, These are the things that we don't concentrate on. We concentrate on the big things, but we fail in this area particularly when it comes to the infamous church potluck, mm. you know, and everything in the in the Christian community tends to revolve around food. And a lot of women uh, get a certain sense of um, worth, self-worth from the food they can prepare and mm-hmm. watching people love eating it. And Enjoying that is good. It, yeah. it just needs to be in balance and in moderation. Again, Asherita, uh, thank you for being with us. If we can, let's continue the discussion online, talk about the fasting and a couple of other things. Can we do that? Sounds great. All right. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there. And be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.